you mentioned neoconservatives. Yeah. The, the thinking among many of the neoconservatives is uh, there's a number of countries under authoritarian governments that really want to be democratic if only we could get the leader out and give them the chance to become democratic. Iraq being, I think, one of the thinkings behind that. Uh, but a lot of these countries seem to be, it, it wouldn't, I, I wouldn't doubt that there's a percentage that would like to be able to move to a free democratic society, but I'm not sure that's the critical majority. Yes. Um, are, there, are we just going to have to have countries that are going to have authoritarians simply because they can't be governed unless they have authoritarians? I think so. I mean, I, support, I was called a neoconservative because I supported, after 9-11, I wanted to get rid of Saddam Hussein. But what I discussed, I was embedded twice in Iraq. Uh, and I, during the surge, and when I, I noticed something, that all of these people signed up and went over there and risked their lives and paid an enormous price, and then the people who advocated that war were all bailing on it. They said, it was my brilliant war in three weeks, but it's your lousy occupation. And so I thought, I'll never be on the wrong side of history again where I, I, I try to agree with these neoconservative intellectuals and then they just flip because their careers are endangered because the war has bad, bad polling. So I, I went over there when, t to see what it was like. I went all over the country with H.R. McMaster and Humvee and then one time in Blackhawks and boy, it reminded me of what uh, a lot of great generals that said, uh, Matthew Ridgway, who saved Korea, said there's only one thing bad, worse than a bad war, and that's losing it. And that was what I'm worried about the neoconservatives. For them, it's a parlor game. Let's go take Libya and recalibrate. Let's take Syria. Let's do this. But it's never, it's going to be a messy, dirty thing, and X people are going to die, and they're not going to be people that, you know, live next door to you. And if you decide you want to go to this war, you better sure as hell see it to the very, very end. And the end is always defined as victory. And there is such a thing as victory. It's not a Neanderthal concept. Everybody said, well, how do you define victory? Well, you know how you define victory when the enemy no longer wants to fight and agrees to your concessions. So I, I think that the neoconservatives don't understand that. And you're absolutely right that democracy requires a cultural framework, uh, the emancipation of women, a free market economy, the protections of private property, and it can't be imposed from on high. Finally, I don't want to go on too long, but if you notice this about the Middle East, to take an example, that when Trump says he really doesn't want to be there, and he says, you know what, I, I'm not, not going to go. These countries call us up and say privately, please, please, come on, you, please, you have to be here. And when the United States says to NATO, I don't know if I really <laughs> think you guys are worth it. Please, please, we're worth it. And before it was always, you're an imperialistic and you're dragging us all over the world. And then when he, so the more reluctant and stronger the United States is, the more eager people are for its participation. And you know that's a, an element of human nature. When you call up everybody and say, am I invited? Am I invited to this party? Oh, not him again. When you say, I just don't think I can make it. And, you, and then people want you. And <laughs> so the United States is back on the A list again because it's stronger and it doesn't really feel that these countries are worth it. And now they're fighting with each other to get us involved. So at least psychologically, it's so much nicer to have these, uh, I know as a journalist, Journalists for our other countries will come to the Hoover Institution and uh, 10 years ago it was, why do you stick your nose in everybody's business? The Middle East is none of your business. I said, okay. And now it's, well, you are not here and your friends are here and they need you here. And it, it's, it's a very strange experience. So I wonder if you've ever had this question before. <clears throat> Dr. Hansen, could you please reconsider my ancient Greece final grade? <laughs> Just... <laughs> So I'm going to have to say who this guy is. James Lawrence, Fresno State, graduate of 87. And there you go. But we do have lots of questions on Brexit and the impact on the United States. You know, it's, I hate to disagree with the president, but he said that he wasn't impeached. He's going to have that withdrawn. You can't withdraw impeachment. He was impeached. If you've got to be, you've got to be. Brexit. I think most of us thought that Brexit was a good idea for two reasons. One, 
the EU had gone beyond the original intent of a common market and it was a utopian enterprise, anti-democratic enterprise that said we're going to invest a permanent cast of intellectuals and politicos in Strasbourg and Brussels. They know what a banana is. They're going to tell you exactly, you Greeks, if your bananas you go in Crete are not five inches long, they're not bananas. And they're going to tell everybody how to live their lives and they're going to demonize as racist, homophobic, sexist, Islam. Anybody who doesn't agree with them. Meanwhile, when they created this social utopia, they ignored the fact that Europeans were marrying at about 33, they were having 1.6 children, they were allowing millions of people, usually Ill under illegal auspices, coming in from the Middle East. They had no defense capability, their GDP was chronically anemic, they didn't even talk about that. All they talked about was how morally and spiritually superior, it wasn't a sustainable project. So Britain has a historical relationship with Canada, with Australia, with New Zealand, and with the United States. And it was always closer, uh, even though proximity-wise Europe. So I think it's the start of a new day, and we didn't force it on the British people. They, they voted voluntarily. So I think what's gonna happen, the British and the United States are, go are gonna be, the Americans are gonna be much closer. I think that's good for the world. And I, I fear that, I don't wanna sound like a lunatic, but for over a century, there was one problem in the world, and it was defined as 1870 to 71, 1914 to 1918, 1939 to 1945. And Tacitus described it in the Germania, and it was basically the German people, centrally located in Europe, industrious, hardworking, imaginative, brilliant, at some point feel that uh, they don't have power and influence commiserate with their own talent and their destiny and they want to make adjustments. And so when you look at the EU today and you see who's governing policy on NATO spending, on immigration, on economic policy, it's Germany, Germany, Germany. And you go over and talk to Hungarians and Czechs and Poles and Greeks and they will tell you off the record that they're terrified of the Deutsche Bank and they're terrified of Germans. And if you had said 1945, what country in Europe will have the least favorable opinion of the United States in 75 years? I think you've been right to guess Germany. So that's the problem that Europe has. There is no EU. It's called the German hegemon. And it's called the EU for euphemistic purposes. But every decision that's made in the EU is governed by Germany. And Germany still feels that it's natural talent, its productivity is not commiserately rewarded. Now, thank God for all of us, that manifests itself in we're going to be the best solar and wind power in the world, or we're going to be the most humane, or we're going to have the, open, the most open borders. But at some point, historically, we know where that leads to. And that's what is scary. And that's a good reason to have NATO, I think. Several questions along this line. I think we can probably all agree that President Trump is often unpredictable. Yes. <laughs> unpredictable. Is it an asset or a liability? Is it intentional or is it random? Being unpredictable, you're all business people, most of you. You know that that's, that's I saw Barack Obama said about six months ago, he's unpredictable. And I thought, it's much preferable to be predictable. <laughs> Obama was predictably anti-American on many issues. And they, they, our opponents knew that. So it's good to be unpredictable within limits as long as it doesn't border on volatile. But nobody knows what he's going to do, and that's good. When people think he can do anything at any minute, anywhere, anytime, to anybody, that's good. When he starts to to go and he can do some things that are quite dangerous and out, that's bad. So within limits, predictability is not as good as unpredictability. So I think that's, that's important. And uh, is it feigned? I think a lot of it is feigned. Take the State of the Union, and everybody said it was a great address. I thought it was a good address, not his, not, I thought it was his best, but not the best, I'm not, people compared it, the Gettysburg Address, it was, <laughs> but there was, there was some brilliant things about it. And what he did intentionally was he interspliced all of these anecdotal stories 
inspirational stories of people who were Hispanic, black, uh, women, and they all, and then he, as a game show host, he brought in, you know, your husband's back, and he had the optics where he knew that half the audience hated his guts and would not stand for him, and he made sure they didn't stand for him because he recited his record first, and then he knew they would not stand for all of these other people, and it completely, humili it was all planned and choreographed. That's something that he does. He's got an animal cunning like nobody I've ever seen. And uh, so a lot of the things, when he says little rocket man, <laughs> everybody says he's a juvenile. No, he's doing that intentionally to show everybody that this guy can't do anything about that. Same thing with Iran. When he says, I've got 52, you know, that's the number of hostages that were taken. It's kind of juvenile to do that. But what he's saying is, what are you going to do about it? We've been told that you can't touch Iran. It's, it's just so powerful. It's not powerful at all. So he does things like that to needle people. You know, and he's cruel. He can be crass. As, as my wife said to me once, I don't like his, during the campaign, she said, I, I always thought Marco Rubio was 6'2". He is little. <laughs> and then... She said, I didn't know what it was about Jeb Bush, but he doesn't have any energy. <laughs> and he had a very cruel ability to, to give a synthesis of person in one or two words that stuck with him. You know, Crooked Hillary stuck with her. And that's, that's I don't know, we, don't, we might not appreciate that, but there's, a, there's an ability of him that people, is very underestimated. And I don't, I don't think anybody quite understands how cunning he is, because he, he really understands human nature. And um, it's, it's a phenomenon that we haven't fully appreciated. And every time that they think they, he's, he plays this roadrunner part to Wiley E. Coyote so well. I mean, Amalamut's Clause, 25th Amendment, the voting machines, the electors, uh, Mueller, Horowitz, impeachment, Ukraine. And they, just when they have his, their arms around his neck, he beep beeps and is off. <laughs> <laughs> Going back to when he announced that he was going to run for president and came down the escalator, yeah. you know, many people said that he was doing it for his brand. When do you think that he really realized that he was leading a movement and had a chance to win? Well, I, I think he thought he had a chance to win, but he might not win, or at least he wouldn't win. But I think after the first debate, do you remember that first debate? And maybe somebody can correct me if it was the second debate, but Rand Paul, who was sort of the maverick and the guy that could say anything and, and you never really wanted to get on Rand Paul's bad side because he didn't care, he could embarrass you. Well, he said, to start off the debate, he said, well, Donald Trump represents the nexus between big money and influence peddling, and that's what I'm here for, to stop people like him. Because Trump was leading in the polls. 22% higher than the other, and Trump didn't bat an eye. He just looked at him and said, hey, that's true, and you came up to my office, you begged me for $10,000, <laughs> I wrote a check, and you've been good to me ever since. And at that moment, it just shattered, and he started to dominate those debates, not through debating skills, but again, cunning. And I think at that point, he thought that, one last anecdote, a very prominent pundit, I won't mention his name, was lecturing a few of us and said, he'll never make it. He was at a debate in Milwaukee and I walked to the other candidates and they had handlers and they had position papers and they had booklets and they had press people. And I saw Trump sitting right over by himself. And I just thought, you know what, I'm going to walk right over to him without interference and talk to him two seconds before the debate and see what happens. So we said, well, what happened? I did that. And I said, well, that's great. He had no prep. He just, he said, no, it's not. It shows you how unprofessional he was. And he won that debate. So I'm thinking that, wow. You know, he, he knew that he had a certain confidence and ability not to, to do anything just by sheer force of energy that, uh, that he was. So I think he knew during the debates that he, had a, uh, he was going to win the nomination. Did he know that he was going to win the election? 
Uh, I think he knew that he was going to win the Electoral College because he had the most sophisticated analytics and he had some really brilliant people that were mapping voters in those, and he thought that he could carry those states. But when you looked at his eyes, that being said, on election night, it was almost as if they were going on circles, like, I can't believe I won. <laughs> so it's hard to tell. The, one of the bigger issues that's emerged now is borders. Uh, and, and it raises the question of whether or not countries are sovereign over their borders. Should they be? Um, then there's the immigration policy. What are your thoughts on a country and borders? I don't think anybody would even ask that we'd have that conversation for the last 2,500 years because a country is defined not just as, I mean, America is a, a country of ideas and common values. We don't care what Americans look like. That's what's great about our country. But it's a pr physical place, and it's a physical place that's not Canada and not Mexico, and it has certain traditions that happened within that physical place. So when you get rid of a border, you destroy the collective memory and history of a country. And then you, there's a di when I go to Canada, things are different. When I go into Mexico, things are different. And people should, so borders are a reminder that this place within these borders are different. It has different assumptions, and it has a particular way. And then you can compare different places because of borders. Europe never understood that because they were so traumatized by World War II. They said nationalism and borders caused World War II, so we're going to get rid of nationalism and borders, and they didn't understand. No, that did not cause World War II. Germany caused World War II, and the Nazi Party, and appeasement by France, and collaboration by the Soviet Union in 1939, and indifference or isolationism by Britain. Take away, if, if take away appeasement and take away the Soviet Union's pact with Nazi Germany and they wouldn't have had World War II, but they took the wrong lesson. So you don't have a nation without a border. And uh, that's what's sad about our policy the last few years. So when we have a border, everybody thinks that these problems are insurmountable. So we, if whatever our pr plan is to deal with the 19 or 20, according to Yale and MIT, illegal aliens in the United States, I think most people think if somebody has not committed a felony and somebody is working and somebody's been a resident for three or four years, they should be eligible to have a green card. Pay a fine, get a green card, and if they want to become a citizen later on, that's their business. 35% of them didn't under Simpson Mazzoli because they had children that were citizens. But if you can't follow those rules, that you commit felonies or you can't find a job or you won't, or you just cross the board, then you should be deported. And I think that's the solution that everybody's going to come to accept. And then as far as the problems that, that we've had with illegal aliens, most studies show that if you came from Mexico legally and you're a legal resident, your rate of integration assimilation in a marriage mimics pretty clearly the Italian-American experience. That if people who came from a poor country, a Catholic country, to a predominantly wealthier Protestant country took a little longer to assimilate, not much. And I have full confidence that we can do that, but we can't do it with an open border. It just never worked in history. Back. Back to China, we have a question from the audience. How do we or should we compete with China's investments in Africa and South America, and I might add everywhere else? <laughs> well, that's a good question. I just got back from Greece, and I, I lived there three, three years to take an example, and they have taken the Piraeus, the second biggest port in the Mediterranean after Naples. And you should see it. It used to be, if anybody saw the movie Zorba the Greek, it starts in the Piraeus. It was a pretty rundown place. And they've spent about $10 billion, and it's a shiny cruise ships, and now they're building a high-speed rail to get out up to Northern Europe, or a link. And so how could we compete with that? But then when you start talking to Greek government officials off the record, and you look at the lease, they don't think China's ever going to make any money out of it. And then you ask, well, they're not stupid. Why would they do it? Well, they think they're doing it for geopolitical strategic reasons. That in time of tensions, maybe a cargo ship would, Chinese cargo ships would be there. They'd open up their cargo and there'd be missiles in it or something. But for right now, these investments are not penciling out. And the second thing that you talk to these countries that have had these huge investments is 
the Chinese are not like Americans. They're more like Cold War Russians. If you went to Egypt or Libya in the Cold War, Russians were in enclaves. They didn't, they didn't integrate. People didn't want to talk to them. China is the same way. They don't get along with your Greeks. They don't get along with Africans. And they're not popular. And you can really see it with this, this corona epidemic. So I don't think we have to compete in that sense that this has been a disastrous policy. They're going to spend trillions of dollars eventually, and they're going to make themselves unpopular. And a lot of these countries are going to default on what they owe China. And we'll see. But that's, I, I think it, if we did it, we'd be called neo-imperialist and colonialist, and we wouldn't do it. Got a question on um, Israel's role in the yes. Middle East. Yes. Uh, most of us would remember the, uh, a time when the Arab nations around Israel were all critical and would like to see it destroyed. Now Israel is working with a number of them, and they've got alliances with a number of the countries that are surrounding them, leaving the Palestinians somewhat more isolated than they were. What's Israel's role now, and how have things changed? And I might add to that, can you comment on the with the peace plan that was announced yes. when only two or three countries stood in yeah. support of it. Yeah. yeah, well, the peace plan that Trump announced, to go to your question first, was essentially an economic one. It said about 95% of 1967 West Bank will go back to the Palestinians, but they'll get a $50 billion investment. And the idea was, and then they just forget about pushing the Jews into the ocean for 10 years, they'll be very wealthy, et cetera. But the big thing about that peace plan was there was nobody that got up and said it's central to uh, Middle East peace. It's not. And that's the difference. So Trump's attitude was, here's a great deal. Take it. But if you don't want to take it, that's your business. The world's going to go on with like, and as far as your patrons in the Gulf, they're kind of tired of you, too. And they're going to worry about Iran. They're lined up with Israel. Uh, it was brought home to me when the Hoover Institution has a military plan where colonels from all over the world come to Hoover. And for the last two years, some people, I won't mention the countries, would talk to us privately. And one of the colonels said to me, and he was actually a member of a royal family, and said, why don't you tell the Jews that we have all of these cruise missiles? I said, what? He said, you know, they're very expensive, but we've got them stockpiled. So when they go into a, a ra Iran, they can use ours. They'll fit. <laughs> and I said, what do you mean? He said, well, we want, we want them to take out Iran. I said, well, then you would blame them. He said, yeah, we'd blame them. We'd say you attacked an Islam. But come on, I'm, we're not adolescents here. And, <laughs> and so that's changed. Then the Palestinians are aligned with Hezbollah, Hamas, Hezbollah, and Iran. And that's a losing card. And I think the world also, and I mentioned this last night, is that in 1945, there was 100 million refugees after World War II. And believe me, there is no such thing today as the Volga Germans. Stalin just got rid of them. And there's no such thing as the Sudeten and Germans and got rid of them. And there's no such thing today as Greek Cypriots in places like Bella Pais, that's 40 years ago. They don't exist anymore. So the world is saying, well, why is it that somebody can say, these are my keys to my house in, in Jerusalem that I lost in 1967? And I think the world is saying, that's about as important or not as important to me as a German driving his BMW into Gdansk and saying, this used to be my paternal estate in Danzig. Nobody cares. And the reason that the Palestinians were the refugees, the only refugees 75 years after everybody else, and by the way, I'm talking about a million Jews that were ethnically cleansed from Syria and Egypt and Jordan after the 1967 war. Nobody said a word. Do any Jews today say, I have to, here's the keys to my apartment in Cairo? They would be laughed out. But we gave such preeminence to the Palestinians because of terrorism and because of oil. And I don't think today uh, those are issues that, that are going to resonate. And uh, so they have a plan. And if they were smart, they would take the money and the plan. And I don't think they'll take either. And I don't think the world, to be frank, will care much. So we have time for one more question. One more question. So this is not a foreign policy question. But yesterday, the World Affairs Council hosted Tony Cronman. 
and he's written this book on the assault on American education, uh, American excellence. And so the question from the audience are, what are your thoughts about the social justice takeover of higher ed education among cultural elites? Hmm. <laughs> Line, what yeah. Tony Coleman said yesterday. So I have a flight today f back to Fresno, so I don't think that I could answer it. You can talk safely here. Yeah. I suspect. Well, I mean, it would take days, but uh, look, the problem with higher education is that it's 90%, at least in the humanities, progressive, left-wing people. I do not see it anymore as disinterested. So they don't think that they're going to teach an inductive method, how to reason inductively, and then give you a body of knowledge to draw on this reference. That's what education was, et ex ducare in, in Latin. OK, so they decided that your family and your religion and your corporation were so right-wing and backward that they were going to be the bastion of liberalism to counteract you. And they had your children for four years, but you had them all the other time. So they said, we don't have to be balanced because the, the whole country's imbalanced. So we're a foil to that, that asymmetry. That was the first thing. The second thing that happened, they became enamored with money and corporate life. So the rate of intuition uh, went up above the rate of inflation every year until about a year ago. And so here, think of that phenomenon where you had all of these professors lecturing these kids about the glories of Marxism, why these kids were paying this exorbitant amount of money and racking up $1.7 trillion in student debt for environmental studies or sociology degrees that the moment they left and graduated, if they did graduate, nobody cared about them. No professor who said, you live in a racist, sexist country. Oh, by the way, what, what are you doing a year later after you graduate? Oh, you have $75,000 in debt at 7%. Good luck. They didn't care. And uh, the teaching loads went down. The non-administrative bloat is skyrocketed. And they all passed it off on this progressive lie. You know, I'm a vice provost for diversity, diversity and inclusion, and I make $400,000 a year and that student is going to borrow for the rest of his youth to pay my salary. So it was kind of a fraud. I know they spiced it up with, you know, cafe bars and rock climbing walls and nice apartments, but the point was they offered a product. They did not warn the student how much it was going to cost, why it was going to cost that much, how much they would owe and what their job and even a, I like used car salesmen, so I don't mean this in a negative way, but a used car salesman would not allow a person to sign a loan under those conditions. And we allowed them to do it. And they took no moral hazard. So where I work, $17 billion endowment to Stanford. You go borrow $300,000 to get an education. And nobody says, you know what? We have a four-year guarantee. Just as we took an SAT test to get into Stanford, so Stanford's going to be subject to an SAT exit test to see how well you learned in four years and if you got your money worth. Mention that to an administrator and they go crazy. They want no accountability that they, that they improve the knowledge and the uh, intelligence of the student after four years. So they're done with them, they use them up, send them away, they get stuck with the debt. What would stop it very quickly are about two or three things to finish. If you had an exit requirement for a BA like you do the law exam, and you said to every student that graduate, you have to take a national test, just like you did to get into a university, the universities would change their curriculum very quickly. Second, if you said every university that co-signs a student loan has moral hazard. So if that student graduates and he defaults on that loan, the government's not going to pick it up, you're going to pick it up. And they would find ways to to do it very quickly. And uh, just to finish very quickly, one last thing is kind of esoteric, but I think it would really work. You can be a professor and not go to the School of Education. So I was turned loose at 26 to teach people, but I'd never had a course in education just because I have a PhD. Same thing is true at a junior college, MA. Why is it that you have to have a, you go to high school students, you have to have an a teaching credential. If we just told everybody you have two choices. When you get your BA and you want to teach in the public schools, you can go to the teacher route and get your teaching credential, which has nothing to do about education, but a lot of therapeutic 
massaging, or you can get a master's degree for a year in an academic subject. It's up to you, either one is valid. I think you would have people in droves prefer to get a, an MA in history or English or biology rather than a teaching credential, and maybe after a rocky six months they'd be far better teachers, and that would solve a lot of the political correctness that we see. Let me just mention in... Dr. Hansen has a date with the Sumner Scholars, so he's got to shift over to a room, so don't come up and sort of surround him and keep him from getting there, because he's got to get there. Uh, IPI has our next uh, Sumner's Luncheon on April 15 with Ken Strassel from the Wall Street Journal, so put that on your agenda. And thank you all for joining us, and thank Dr. Hansen.